The longest running off road and action motorsports radio show on the planet is coming to you live with the biggest guest in motorsports. Here is the only man on the planet who can pack this much dirt slinging and tire slaying into two hours a week. Sit back, strap in, and be prepared to get your ears blown. Here is Jim Beaver and the Down and Dirty Radio Show, powered by Polaris Razor. Welcome to the General Tire Down and Dirty Show, powered by Polaris Razor, kicking off a 2020 first episode of the year. And yes, you heard that right, G- the General Tire Down and Dirty Show, powered by Polaris Razor. General Tire, been a partner in the show almost since the beginning. They have stepped up their involvement, taken on the title sponsor role, and I am absolutely stoked. We'll be doing a lot of stuff with them, remote stuff around the country. They got some badasses uh, from all different walks in motorsports and influencers, and we're going to be on site at events uh, you know, from coast to coast, I'm really, really excited to ramp things up with General Tire. Uh, you're going to see in the coming weeks, you're going to see some branding changes on the website already taking place. You're going to see some changes uh, to the sh- intro show and, and to a lot of things in and around the show. And uh, I am really stoked to have them on board and to have Polaris Razor back in the same position that they have been for a very, very long time. So, uh, yes, welcome aboard, General Tire. Welcome, I guess, further aboard. Uh, thank you, Polaris Razor. And we got some amazing partners coming on board this year, my good friends at Rigid Industries. We've got GSP XTV Axles. We have some of the best uh, I guess uh, businesses in motorsports and in the endemic uh, coming on board. Our good friends at Acronis, they are on board as well. Just so many amazing partners in the show. Thank you guys. It is going to be one heck of a 2020. Speaking of 2020, this is going to be a little bit different episode today. It's kind of like a soft start to the year. We're going to have a hard start next week. We've got some massive news in regards to how you can listen to the show coming in the upcoming weeks as well. Um, but uh, yeah, this is kind of a, a, a soft start, uh, you know, mainly because because it's the first week of the year, and I have a race. I literally all week long been planning for the Best in the Desert Parker 250. I'm going to be banging doors with the best in the business in my Polaris Razor this weekend. So we didn't have a chance to do a full rollout of the show. Um, so uh, yeah, it's uh, we got a couple of amazing guests this week, and then it's a little bit different format to the show. Next week we will be back to our traditional format that you guys know, love, and expect. Uh, but our two guests this week, I'm very very excited to have Jackie Reese. Now I was up. Um, at ERX and did the X Games snow bike qualifiers at ERX. And uh, there was this girl that uh, really caught my attention and everybody there. Her name's Jackie Reese. She is an absolute badass on a snow bike competing against a guy. She actually raced every single race that day, uh, just about every single race. I think uh, maybe there was one or two she didn't race, but uh, like full on Iron Woman style. And she hauls ass and she was racing against the guys. I went, you know what? I got to have her on the show. Uh, I think this interview we're going to roll out today, you guys are going to absolutely love. Uh, you know, and this girl, she is, uh, you know, she's a force to be reckoned with on a snow bike. And I think you guys are really going to enjoy this interview with Jackie Reese. You should definitely give her a follow on Instagram. She's slaying it. And then we've got a, an extended, uh, I guess, extended cut, a very long interview with my boy Street Bike Tommy. Uh, Tommy, he just launched a new show where he blows things up. Yeah. Street Bike Tommy blowing things up. Well, you know what that means? We're going to have him on the show and uh, anytime i get to catch up on my boy street bike tommy talk about uh, what's happening there at the pastrana compound his barbecue business uh just uh you know racing things wrecking things blowing things up you know it's going to be a fun time so street bike tommy is on the show this week and uh, we're probably lucky that this particular episode isn't airing in national syndication because i will give you fair warning maybe a few four-letter words are tossed around when street bike tommy and i do an interview together so they aren't bleeped so i'm just telling you if you're one of our younger listeners expect that um not too bad it's not like the whole thing's full of uh stuff but uh yeah just a little disclaimer there but uh yes it is going to be a great show i know uh, over the holidays i made my way up to minnesota Spent some time uh, with my boy, Levi LaValle. He took me snowmobiling, and uh, I got to tell you, I've been snowmobiling plenty of times in my life, but, uh, you know, snowmobiling with Levi LaValle, that is always fun. You know, we're just riding ditches, going across frozen lakes, things like that, and uh, anytime you can watch one of the best guys to ever ride a snowmobile and just follow him along, absolutely amazing, mind-blowing to see how good that guy was. I mean, he was, like, jumping out of ditches and doing tricks, like, just, it, it was, like, stuff, like, 
you just, I don't know. It's crazy. You got to see it. But funny, funny story. And uh, I, I'm going to have Levi on uh, in the next couple of weeks. So uh, he'll be able to chime in on this. But uh, and he's actually starting his own podcast, which uh, I think will be kind of rad. Um, but uh, Levi, so we literally get to this frozen lake. And, uh, you know, it's been a warm winter for Minnesota for the most part. Things are frozen over. But uh, he goes, all right, Jimmy. He says, see those spots out there where there's the water? And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he's like, it's all mushy and stuff like that. He's like, so he's like, this lake, he's like, it it froze over. And he's like, but he says there's some soft spots where you you might fall through the ice a little bit. I'm like, fall through the ice a little bit, dude. Like, I'm from Arizona. I, I don't like this fall through the ice stuff. And he goes, no, 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 no. He's like, so there's ice and then there's some water and then there's more ice. And he's like, see where that's at? He's like, it's not open water. It's just like, it's really kind of wet and slushy. And he's like, it is water, but he's like six or eight inches under it. There's more ice. I promise you. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to argue with Levi Lavalley. Boy's from Minnesota. He knows his ice. But um, he's like, so he's like, I'm just telling you. He's like, if you're going on your snowmobile across this lake and the ice breaks, he's like, just floor it. And he's like, as long as you're going, you're going to be fine. And I'm like, so the ice is going to break and my snowmobile is going to fall into the water. But as long as I stay on the gas, I'm good. He goes, yeah, you're good. He's like, I promise underneath the water, there's more ice. And I'm looking at him like, and then he just goes, all right, I'll see you on this other side of the lake. And he just hauls, he just hauls ass. And so I'm looking at this lake and there goes Levi and he's just buzzing around there. And I'm like, well, this is about sketchy, right? And so I'm like, "Uh, all right, I'm like, let's go for it. I go and we get out there and about this body told me, boom, ice breaks. Bottom of the snowmobile starts falling through the ice. I gun that thing and uh, I'm like, whoa, this is like the, uh, you know, and I know there's ice under there because he tells me, but the, the literally the back track is in the water and I'm chewing through the ice and the powder that's formed on there. I get across the lake and I got to tell you, you want to talk about an adrenaline rush and I know there was ice under there, but the feeling of riding a snowmobile across a lake and having the ice break underneath you, even though there's another layer of ice, like, uh, you know, six, eight inches down, it is the weirdest feeling. And, uh, yeah, I mean, we had a great time. I got to give a big thank you to him, uh, you know, for loaning me the sled and, uh, you know, taking me out. But uh, I got to tell you, that was kind of uh, uh, (laughs) one of the highlights of my winter break. It was uh, was pretty wild. But snowmobile in Lila Valley, like, who's going to turn that down? No buddy um but uh yeah good times up there i know we'll have him as a guest on the show uh coming up you know like i said before it's gonna be a little bit uh uh weird uh show today i mean normally we'd be talking about supercross we'd have power rankings um we'd be talking about the dakar rally going on we are gonna get to all of that it's gonna be the start of next week though because right now i am literally heading to uh jump in my razor and take it through tech inspection at the race and i'm recording this show kind of in between that so uh couple of great guests today jackie reese trust me follow this girl on instagram you're gonna like it uh you're gonna like this interview she is rad she deserves the follow give her some love uh and then street bike tommy man what more can i say you know street bike tommy is a badass so uh yeah we are gonna roll this and uh you guys tuning in hopefully you guys enjoy it i'll be back at the end of the show to uh kind of kind of wrap things up here uh but uh, yeah should be a solid one today with jackie reese street bike tommy and uh follow me along uh this weekend at jim beaver 15 on social media i will be racing my polaris razor out in the desert banging doors with the best in the business and it should be fun so uh yeah we're going to take a short commercial break here on the general tire down and dirty show powered by polaris razor we come back jackie reese she's locked and loaded right here on the show you want extreme performance reliability and the most fun you can have on four wheels the polaris razor brings it to you but you don't need to take my word for it you can take theirs. I'm Tanner Faust, and I choose the Polaris Razor because it's the most fun you can have with a steering wheel. What's up? I'm Ronnie Renner, and I choose Polaris Razor because it's the sickest, most reliable side-by-side on the planet. What's up, everybody? Heavy D from Diesel Brothers. Listen, I'm on Team Razor because it's hands down the best piece of machinery on the planet. I'm RJ Anderson, and I choose Polaris Razor because it's the most fun, most capable machine. Action sports stars, TV personalities, and some of the best race car drivers in the world all choose Polaris Razor because it's the ultimate combination of power, suspension, agility, and fun. Find out more information on the web at PolarisRazor.com or follow at Polaris Razor on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and use the hashtag RazorLife to share your story. Ford WP is more than a store. We're truck and Jeep experts and have been for over 50 years. From wheel and tire upgrades to full custom builds, Ford WP has you covered. 
Whether you want to order the best parts online or shop in store, do the work yourself or get it done by a pro, all roads lead to 4WP. Do your rig right. Shop online or find your store at 4WP.com. For 100 years, General Tire has provided tires for your lifestyle, your adventure, your anywhere. Born from competition, the Grabber Tire offers the durability and off-road traction you demand in a tire. We put these tires to the test in the harshest off-road racing conditions to give you a tire that will make your anywhere possible. So let us take you on your next big adventure. Tweet us photos at General Tire, hashtag anywhere is possible. Because with General Tire, anywhere is possible. When looking for a new wheel for your off-road vehicle, car, truck, or UTV, the choice is easy. You choose what the pros use. Rob McCachron, Keegan Kincaid, and myself, Jim Beaver, all exclusively use Vision Wheel, whether we're dominating Baja, taking the cup at Cranon, or shredding UTVs. Vision Wheel's trend-setting designs and durability will set you apart from the competition and your friends. Check out visionwheel.com or at Vision Wheel on social media to learn more. Super ATV is the industry leader in aftermarket UTV and ATV parts and accessories. Super ATV products are designed, engineered, tested, and manufactured right here by Super ATV. Whether you're looking to upgrade your suspension, get stronger axles, or you're looking for a new winch to get you out of a tough spot, Super ATV has what you're looking for. And since we know you're in a hurry, we offer fast, free shipping to the lower 48 states on all orders. Visit SuperATV.com now and get your UTV or ATV dialed in. Like what you hear? Catch all the back episodes of the Down and Dirty Radio Show on Apple Podcast, and be sure to rate, review, and subscribe. Welcome back to the Down and Dirty Radio Show, powered by Polaris Razor. I would like to welcome Jackie Reese to the show, who I met uh, about a month ago at ERX Motor Park, uh, snow bike racer. What is happening, Jackie? Oh, nothing, just hanging out in the Starbucks parking lot. <laughs> hanging out in the Starbucks parking lot. How's the weather up there in Minnesota right now? Uh, today is much warmer than yesterday. It was the balmy, like, 11 yesterday. Balmy so we're 11. doing good at, like, 35 now. Yeah. I got to say, I lucked out. I was in Minnesota after ERX for, like, two weeks. Uh, and I spent some time in northern Minnesota, did some snowmobiling with my buddy Levi and – uh I got to tell you, it was like mid thirties the entire time I was back there. And I've been in Minnesota sometimes in the winter time. It was like negative 25. And I was like, what on earth are we doing here? Like 35 degrees plus fresh powder. Like it was perfect. Yes. We lucked out this year for sure. Yeah. So far, right. That mean it could get worse though. In Minnesota, <laughs> you never know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Before you came up, it was like negative 20. It was, it was terrible. <laughs> yeah. I just avoided the, avoided the nastiness. <laughs> Oh, so yeah, no, I reached out to you. I actually, you know, you know, I'd heard of you, but never really met you or anything until uh, ERX. And then all of a sudden we're at ERX Motor Park and, uh, you know, they start the racing and here's, you know, a girl racing named Jackie Reese and she's doing pretty solid. And then the next race, here's Jackie Reese. And then the next race, here's Jackie Reese. And then the next race, here's Jackie Reese. And I'm like, holy crap. Like, I don't know. What did you end up doing? Like 12 races that day or something like crazy like that? Yeah, I did 10 races that day, uh, 50 laps of racing, plus about five laps of practice in the morning. So I was definitely beat by the end of the day, but it was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was funny because, uh, you know, all of a sudden we're up there announcing and then the in walks, in you walk, you know what I mean? You're like, hey, I'm Jackie. And we're like, yes, sit down. We want to talk to you. Like, what? <laughs> Like, holy crap, like, you know, most, most, I'll say most guys racing, like they do, you know, they do a couple motos or whatever and they're, they're lick. Like, well, what is the thought process? Be, I mean, like you're putting your body through hell going through that many, that many laps. And I mean, I know you enjoy it. Like, uh, what, what's the story though? Like, I guess it's better to be on the bike than sitting in the pits, right? Yeah, for sure. I, uh, the previous weekend we had our first qualifier in Colorado and they split that day up into two. So on the next weekend when we got to ERX, we were doing two days of racing in one. And, um, you know, the way it's set up, you sign up for both both rounds. Um, so I didn't really realize I was racing that much until I, like, kind of sunk in the day before. I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm really going to – I'm going to race a lot tomorrow. But um, it's, it's totally worth it, you know, at a shot to qualify for X Games and to prove a point in the women's class that we deserve our own class at X Games. So – uh, we we came to make a statement, and um, 
hopefully we did that. Yeah. Well, and you know, how, how did all of a sudden like you uh, get bit by the snow bike bug? Because I know you've raced motocross, you know, a good chunk of your life, but uh, how, how did the gateway, I guess, to snow bikes open? Because like, I've been calling the sport, I've, I've done it for three or four years at ERX. Like I've followed it for a while, but it's still kind of in its infancy. Like, you know what I mean? And there's a lot of people who haven't kind of crossed over and tried it yet that are motocross racers and things like that. Like, how did you, like, how was your gateway into snow bikes? Yeah, so my best friend, Shayna, she was going out to Utah to go to a race, and um, I was home on J-term, I was home from school, and she needed somebody to go with her, and I was like, well, I'm home, I'm not doing anything, I'll go with. Um, her dad, unfortunately, couldn't come with her that race, so we we packed up, she was out in South Dakota, so I drove to her house, and then we drove from there, and um, she had her bike and her practice bike, and like halfway there, she was like, um, by the way, you're going to race. I was like, what? What? <laughs> okay, so I hopped on the bike um, that Saturday for practice in the morning, ended up racing that day, and took third out of four. So not terrible. Uh, motocross experience definitely helped, but uh, we've come a long way from, from then. Yeah, it's funny just watching the sport, though. Like, you talk about you coming a long way, the sport's come a long way, because I know – I, I'm going to have to go back to like 2013 or 14 first snow bike race I ever saw was like in Crested Butte, Colorado. And like, it was, it kind of sucked to watch. I'll be honest with you. Like it, it was bad. <laughs> it was bad. That's the easiest way to put it. And I'm like, why would anybody want to do this? And then like fast right. forward and I'm like, man, like this is legit, like bad fast. Like, you know, jumps are way bigger than they were. Like, I mean, the sport has come a hell of a long way, you know? Yeah, the sport and the the equipment and the riders, like, I think about motocross, like, how many decades have we put into bike development and rider development? And in the past five years, how far snow biking has come, you know, com compared to that. So, you know, it, it is still a very young, small sport, but these guys that are out there winning X Games, like, they've figured it out, they're hitting triples, they're going fast, like, it's it's really incredible and it's awesome for me to be at the very beginning of it too. Yeah. Well, you know, and I, I think what's, what's rad too is, is like, I've got a, good, a lot of good friends from, you know, professional motocross. I mean, Sarah Price, Jolene Van Butte, Vicki Golden, like they're all good friends of mine. And, you know, I saw what they did with kind of the sport of motocross. But now there's you and there's quite a few others. You mentioned your friend Jane or Shana. And, uh, you know, you got like this core group of, uh, of girls who are, are really kind of trying to push the women's movement on snow bikes now. Yeah, I'm, I started a page called Snow Bike Girls about a year ago. And really it was, it was because – I was told that there aren't any women out there. And I was like, well, okay, I don't really believe that. So I started this page, and I have, I have like, hundreds of girls that don't necessarily race, but they go out there, they ride, they ride backcountry, and um, it's, it's a great community just to show the power of numbers in the sport and, and show that, you know, we deserve a shot too. So it's, it's definitely cool to be on that aspect of the growth of this tiny sport as well. Yeah. Well, you being, uh, you know, a motocross racer, what was the biggest transition? Because I know, like, snow bikes, I, I've ridden them, but not, like, not a lot. But, uh, I mean, like, you know, the no front brake, right? I mean, they're, they're, like, from what I understand, it's like a complete change up from being fast on a dirt bike to being fast on a snow bike. Yeah. So, basically, you don't really need to touch your brakes. Um, it's just a brake on the track. And, really, if you let off the gas, you're just you're sinking into the snow. It's so resistant on that bike um the biggest difficulty for me really was jumping with such such a longer motorcycle like just getting over in your head that you know like how fast you have to go and things like that to to calculate for that you know basically double the length of a dirt bike yeah i never really thought about that you know and it, that's kind of crazy you know and i've interviewed quite a bit of guys that are race snow bikes and stuff but i didn't really think about that like you, you've got to judge your speed a little bit different because you're going to case or hang up just because there's so much more off the rear end of the bike right yeah exactly and and then we get into uh, more technical tracks so it, what we're racing really is more like supercross than motocross so then you're trying to do very tight doubles and you know in something that a snowmobile would be able to just kind of like ride over the top on we're trying to double in these very small in small gaps in between jumps. So it, it becomes a whole new challenge, and it's, it deserves a lot of respect for the guys that can really go for those technical rhythms and things like that. 
Well, and that was going to be my next question because I know you just raced Canterbury, uh, which is you know it's it's kind of like the Indy 500 of snowmobile racing. It's a <laughs> big it's a big event there in Minnesota. It's kind of like the it's the one you want to win, right? Um, so, yeah. but when you guys race with ISOC, you're racing on snow cross tracks, you know, the one at ERX, it was kind of a little more designed for snow bikes and, and things like that. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like when you guys race with ISOC, I mean, it's a, it's a snow cross track. I mean, it, like you said, it's gotta be a little bit harder for you just to adapt to that, you know, and change your riding style because it is geared more towards snowmobile racing than snow bike racing. Yeah, exactly. And it's, um, it's been interesting to grow with them because they're very, interested in our sport as it's it's growing and i have people come up to me at races and ask me about snow bikes and people come now just to watch the snow bikes they don't come to watch the snowmobiles anymore which is um something you know like three five years ago that was not a thing uh, so they've been awesome to try and work with us and see what can be better for us and for our show and um you know but we have had to adapt as well to things that are much more technical and much more super crossy compared to the snow bike specific tracks that we had at erx um, and Colorado, where they're more motocrossy, the jumps are a little more spread out, so you can um, you can get a better flow through them and things like that. Yeah. So uh, you know, what, I mean, gosh, it's a, like you said, you were trying to qualify in for X Games and things like that, and you know, and you it was more kind of making a statement, hey, you know, we're, we're here, you know, we we want uh, you know we want our our moment at X Games, and you know, I know uh, it's funny because there's a lot of disciplines, you know, I know like uh, you know, and you look at Summer X and uh, you know Women's Freestyle BMX, you know, and they're pushing really hard, kind of like you guys are on the snow bike thing, you know, trying to trying to get an opportunity there to showcase. Uh, you know what they have what, what you know what's what's next for you obviously are you uh still are you doing the whole isoc schedule or are you just doing some of those that are closer to minnesota no i'm doing the whole schedule last year um last year i finished 10th overall in the snow bike class and so now this year they've divided us up into amateur and pro i'm still racing pro and you know my goal is to be top 10 again which is definitely tough with the competition i'm racing last weekend uh our show was x games so it's it's really, uh, it was a tough weekend, I'll tell you that, but, you know, it's the tough times that, that really showcase your hard work and, and the people that are behind you and believe in you. Yeah. Well, and, you know, I think that's kind of rad that you're racing pro, you know, because a lot of people are like, oh, I'm going to run amateur because I know I can win races. And you're like, you know, like, what's a podium in amateur? I'd rather, you know, if I can finish top 10 in pro, like, that's a bigger statement. Like, I can appreciate that, like, you pushing yourself and not laying up and taking, uh, you know, I don't want to say take easy victories because that's taking away from the talent that are running amateur, you know what I mean? But, like, you know, you're right. just pushing yourself, right? I can appreciate that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah. So, I don't know. All that being said, what's uh, what's the next event for you? I know, obviously, you're kind of uh, taking, uh, I don't know, you, it seems like any event that pops up that's got snow bikes, you're bam, you're there, right? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I'm pretty diehard at this point. I, I graduated college last May and decided to postpone a career and, and put my effort into this for now. So, you know, if it's happening, I'm there. Um, next up is Deadwood, South Dakota, Snowcross, and it's the same weekend as X Games, so... Um, you know, I have a little bit better of a shot to do well because everybody super fast will be at X Games. Um, so hopefully, you know, last year it was a highlight for me. I got two podiums there. So I, I'm looking to do that again. And, and really that weekend was so much fun. I met a bunch of little kids and little girls that think it's, that snow biking is just so cool now. So I, I'm excited to go back to a place with people like that. That's rad. You know, and you'd said, you know, you kind of, um, you obviously you got a college degree to fall back on, but you know, you're talking about, you know, trying to make a go of this thing. Like how is it? Because it, it's a sport that's still, like you had said, kind of, it's getting established, but it's still in its infancy. I mean, uh, you know, at some point, you know, I know some of the guys running X Games, they've got some big sponsors stepping in. And, you know, I know uh, Timber Sled through Polaris has been really highly involved. But, I mean, are you, uh, you know, are, are some of the doors starting to open with uh, with sponsors and things like that? And especially with what you're doing, like, are you still finding it pretty tough? Is it a pretty tough sell to get, you know, people on board with a snow bike program? Um, it's definitely difficult. Like, I reached out to so many out-of-industry companies this year and only heard back from, like, three. Uh, two of them denied me, and luckily one of them, Soul Addict, uh, they helped me out this year a little bit financially. But my biggest sponsor is really Yeti Snow and Max. Um, so you talk about Timber Sled and Polaris. Yeti Snow and Max is, um, you know, is affiliated a bit with Camzo, but they're their own company. They make, um, I mean, in my opinion, 
which might be a little bit biased, the best <laughs> best Snow White kit out there. Um, but really, it's carbon fiber with a bunch of titanium parts on it. You know, like you can't really get any better than that. And the game that we play with these things is how light can we make them to make them faster, basically how to jump them better and, you know, things like that. So it's definitely difficult, but they, you know, I, I hadn't even, I had one phone call with Yeti Snowmax and they were like, all right, we want to sponsor you. And I was like, really, like, wow. It's so it just shows how amazing they are, you know, just to have people that believe in you and believe in your mission, especially um, with the women's involvement that I have, you know, they believe in that too. So it's super awesome to have people like that behind me. Yeah. Well, and no, I agree. And, you know, here's a question for, you You know, I know we, you know, we're talking about, uh, you know, kits right now, you know, and, and, uh, you know, in kits that you apply to a dirt bike, do you, you think you see at some point, like I think I see at some point, like one of these manufacturers coming in and being like, all right, we're going to make a dedicated snow bike. It's not a kit. It's just a legit snow bike. You know what I mean? Designed from the ground up, you know, to be a snow bike, you know, and, and it's not a dirt bike that got adapted over. Do you see at some point, you know, in the future, one of these manufacturers making a legit just a snow bike? Um, Artica actually tried one of those. And it, it didn't work out too well. Um, but, you know, it, it is interesting to think about how these kits will change in the future. And kind of like what I said earlier, like, we put so much time into dirt bikes, like however many decades into developing these motorcycles to be the best that they can be. Well, how much, like, over that much time, how much will these kits change? Like, really, um, I, I foresee them moving under the motorcycle more, um, you know, to shorten them a bit, like, I've, I've noticed with Timber Sled's new race model, it's quite a bit farther underneath the bike. Um, and, you know, if you look at a snowmobile, the track is way pushed under the body of it. So I think that's something that could change. Um, I definitely think that we got to figure out how to make dirt bikes run better in the winter <laughs> because, you know, they, they like 60 degrees and uh, most of the time we're racing at 30. So that's also something that can change in the future. Um, I don't think it would be a bad thing for a brand to come out with a snow bike specific bike. You know, it would make it a lot easier for the average consumer to go out and buy a snow bike instead of having to go buy a 450 and then buy a kit. Um, you know, but also who knows how it's going to change over the next five more years. Yeah. Well, you know, and I know like you, you talked and I know when they first came out, you know, it was kind of a one size fits all uh, you know, track and things like that. And there weren't a whole lot of options. Now there's options. I mean, we see the guys on, you know, in freestyle and X games and, you know, they're running a really, really short track so they can backflip easier and things like that. And I think like now it's kind of mm -hmm. cool that we're to the point where it's not a one size fits all. Like you can, you can actually go and adapt things and kind of really customize them to your riding style, you know? Yeah. And, and they make longer kits for backcountry riding too, um, to help with climbing and, and deep powder conditions. So there are options, but um, the, on the racing side, I foresee things becoming shorter and narrower and, you know, more easily maneuverable yeah. than what, not that they're difficult now, but, you know, than what it is right now. Yeah. Well, I got to ask, have you, you talked about backcountry, and I know Chris Barant's been trying to get me out on a snow bike in some backcountry there in Colorado for quite a while, but have you had a ch chance to... Uh, take a snow bike into the back country because from what i understand like you guys are racing them on the track but they say like a snow bike is really home when you're out in like the deep powder in the back country like that's where those things really just like hook up and it's so much fun yeah for sure i had uh, a handful of days out in the back country and and that's really where snow biking began is in the back country of idaho um so you know that's what they're originally designed to do and that's kind of what they're good at um, it's so much fun. It's, it's so creative. Um, you know, just like any sort of free riding, you know, you get, you have to see that line, you have to pick it and go for it and through the tight trees. And it's different than a snowmobile because it's so much narrower. You can sit between trees and find a hidden meadow that no snowmobile has touched all year. And so it's a really cool opportunity to explore really nature and places that you might not be able to get on a dirt bike in the summer. Like if you got across the river, it's frozen in the winter. You can just go across it and you can find a whole another side that you've never explored before. So it's pretty cool. And it's definitely something I wish I had the opportunity to do more of.
Yeah. Well, and you know, that being said, like you had any scary moments on any kind of like water crossings or something like that. I know, like I always hear crazy stories about like, uh, you know, Levi was telling me about like when he was a kid, the ice started to crack and he just gunned it and he's like going over open water and stuff like that. Like you're from Minnesota, you deal <laughs> with frozen lakes. Like you ever had any scary moments like that out there? No, I mean, really tree wells, that's about it. And that was kind of, you know, that's my bad, just getting too close to them, but those will eat you up for sure. Yeah. So any, uh, you know, I know freestyle's is taking off any, any part of you that goes, man, I think I really want to hit one of these big kickers or something like that. Are you pretty happy just uh, staying on the track? Uh, no, I'm good on the track. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a huge jumper to begin with. So, uh, yeah, I will pass on the ramp this year. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you know, here's a, here's a question, like legit question. Like you, you know, you are quite a bit smaller, you know what I mean, than a lot of the guys you're racing against. I mean, you know, and there's times in racing where smaller lighter is an advantage. I mean, and, and you're competitive, you know what I mean? You're competitive with the guys. Like, how how are you? How have you adapted to, to – I know you got to work out. Like, one, I know you're working out quite a bit just to be able to do the amount of – sheer amount of races that you're doing in a day at some of these events and things like that. But how have you been able to adapt, you know what I mean, just to compete with some of the guys that are a little bit bigger? Because you figured out a way to do it, you know, and you're wicked fast. Thank you. I, uh, it's just seat time, really. Like, in the summer, I ride a KTM 150, and, and then I, you know, the first ride of the year on a 450 with a kit, it, that thing is heavy. <laughs> and, and so it's just, you know, getting used to that again. And, um, you know, I do go to the gym. I run a lot. I, I weight lift a lot. And, uh, yeah, time and effort. But it, there are advantages and disadvantages to being little. Um, definitely starts. Like, that's cool, especially when we were in Colorado racing at Elevation. Um, I pulled a couple whole shots. That was pretty awesome uh, just to be smaller at, at altitude against, um, you know, there's a lot of mod bikes out there. Yeah. My bike is very stock, so that was a good advantage for me. But also the disadvantage is that, you know, being aggressive through jumps and things like that, like I don't have the weight to throw around on my bike to, to make it do what I want all the time. Like, obviously, you know, I can do a little bit, but it's, it's different than if I was 50 to, you know, a hundred pounds heavier than I am right now. Yeah. So like you said, seat time, picking your lines, kind of uh, hitting your marks. You know, I feel like you got to be a lot more precise than probably some of the guys like you, you probably have no room to be sloppy. You know what I mean? Like, you know, they, they can make a mistake and you know what I mean? And they've got weight and everything else to bail them out. Like you, I feel like you've got to hit your marks like every single time, you know? Yeah. Yeah. If, if I swap something, like if I come off the lip of a jump and I swap in a weird way or something like that, like I'm toast, I'm on the ground for sure. And, um, you know, that's, that's just something else to learn how to counteract, I guess. But um, like you said, it's it's different to have a little bit more weight to you to, to push the motorcycle where you want it to go. Yeah. So what's, it, what's the worst off you've had on a snow bike? Um, that one at ERX at the end of the day. I don't know if you saw it. Yeah, no, I saw I it. Know, yeah. I, yeah, that was not good. <laughs> I... I I don't really know what happened. I was very exhausted yeah. by that point, and it was, you know, it was like the second to last lap I did all day. And um, you were gassed at I that point. I, like it, you, to your credit, like you were completely yeah. gassed. Like I don't think there's one person there that went, "Oh, she made a mistake." I think it was everybody like, "Oh man, that girl is tired." You know what I mean, like I, I, <laughs> I think that was that was sheer. And you could see when you you were getting up, you're just like, "I'm over it. It's time to be done for today." <laughs> hand me the walker like I'm <laughs> I'm out I feel like I, it took me like three or four days to recover from that like my body was just exhausted after that day and um you know we we talk about bad get off but really like it wasn't that bad because I landed in soft snow if that would have been dirt I would have you know I would have broken something so it's it's different it's definitely different than crashing on dirt it's you know crashing is never good but definitely a little bit more ideal than what it could have been yeah no and I never really thought about that too and I, I mean trust me I know a get off hurts in the snow like you, you know especially in some of the hard pack like it you know it's not softer but I didn't really think about that you know I, I guess it probably is a 
there is it is a little bit more forgiving than the dirt, and you know you're not getting quite as ma- much you know I guess probably cuts and scrapes and bruises when you fall in the snow as you would on hard packed dirt and things like that. Like I guess there is a little bit of an advantage, you know what I mean, to being able to crash in the snow. Yeah, I um this weekend at Canterbury, I uh, I got taken out and the guy ran over my front fender. My he ran over my handlebars and broke the metal perch, like just oh, cut it. Perch. Okay, so that's like. Yeah, and yeah. I was like, well, that's insane, but his, so that was with his ski, his track ran over my hand, and I'm, I'm lucky my hand was in the snow, like, it flexed with the snow, if it would have been dirt, like, my hand would have been broken, like, I'm, I'm so thankful for the FXR medical crew they have there, they have, they can x-ray right there on the spot, I was like, uh, guys, like, <laughs> my hand just got run over, and it's, it's pretty sore still from this weekend, but honestly, like, if that was dirt, it would have been, it would have been broken for sure. Yeah. Is there, is there, and I got to ask, like, uh, you know, and I know like just from being around you at ERX and stuff like that, like it, you guys are all a big family, you know what I mean? Like you knew everybody on the track, like, you know, you know, every storyline, like I, I swear X yeah. games are idiots if they don't have you in the booth calling things like straight up. I'm just going to say it out there. And I know people at X games, listen, Jackie Reese, she needs to be in the booth at X games. I'm just saying, but <laughs> I would. I, oh my gosh, I wish, I wish our races, our series didn't overlap. Yeah. Like they're, they told us this year that they weren't going to, and they were two races overlapped with each other. So hopefully next year we get it figured out because it's really no good for the sport. if the whole show can't be in one place. Yeah. So it's, it's only beneficial to each series to have everybody there. Yeah. Um, but I would enjoy announcing definitely. And, and like you said, it is a big family, and I know everybody because, it, you know, I've been doing this for three years, and that's kind of when this whole thing started um, really taking off. And, and I get to know everybody, and it may be different because, you know, I'm the girl and I'm a little, like, easy to talk to or something, but, you know, I, I hear I hear everybody's stories. I hear their difficulties. I hear what they're doing in the gym and, and things like that. So, you know, it's, um, it's definitely – exciting for me to watch my friends on tv at x games yeah so you ever like you're talking about getting taken out is there ever a point where like you know obviously they know you're a competitor and uh, you go back to the pits and like you ever get fired up and they see you like coming at them they're like oh damn what do i do now like you know on a move like that i mean is is there ever a switch that gets flipped and you're just like nice nah, on <laughs> um I mean, I don't go at people, but the people around me know I'm fired up. I'm like, oh, my gosh, did you see that guy? And really, like, there is a target on my back. Like, no no guy wants to get beat no. by the girl, you know. So it's – uh this weekend, you know, I was telling you earlier, it was kind of difficult. But, I, dude, I got landed on three times. I got taken out twice. Like, it was – like, it was not an ideal weekend, and that's just kind of, you know – a testament to how rough and challenging racing these dudes is like really it's 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 no easy thing to just go out there it's not like we're just going out there racing we're like we're robin's racing at these kinds of things yeah well and and you i guess you gotta respect them too because they're racing you like any other competitor one they don't want to lose to a girl but two like (laughs) They, they have a respect level where they'll ride, they'll race against you hard enough where, you know what I mean, they're not laying up. You know they're bringing their A yeah. game with you, you know, yep. so that's got to make you feel awesome. Yeah. Yeah, that too. And, you know, that's what I get for racing these dudes. You know, I'm not just going to the races where they have a women's class. Like, this is what I signed up for, How however difficult or, you know, down-putting it can be. It's, you know, it's the statement I'm trying to make is that, you know, we're this women, we are this tough too, so. Nice. You know, if I can, if I can take the brunt of that, for you know, for other women to have an opportunity at some point, I'll do it. Yeah. Well, Jackie, it's been fun having you on the show. I know uh, we've taken up two segments here on the national show, and uh, we'll probably drop this as a podcast too, standalone. So, uh, but uh, I appreciate the time. Always fun. Uh, you know, it was fun. You know, calling you know the races with you. Hopefully, we see you out at the track soon, and we'll definitely have to. Uh, I'm Polaris rider Jim Beaver. I race trophy trucks professionally, host a down and dirty radio show, and also travel the country announcing motorsports events. I've seen it all, and trust me, I've done most of it. So when it comes time to relax on the weekend, nothing is better than taking time with my family in our Razor vehicles. They've got the reliability I need to just pick up and go explore the desert dunes or trail and have the capability to attack even the
even the harshest terrain. If you're looking for some of the most reliable and safest and hands down most capable off-road machines in the world, look no further than Polaris and their award-winning lineup of Razor vehicles. Whether you want your daughter to experience off-road driving for the first time in a Razor 170 like me, take the entire family out in a Razor XP4 1000 on the weekend, or shred the desert and dunes in the all-new Razor XP 1000 Fox Edition, Polaris has you handled. Take my advice and join me and some of the best drivers in the world by driving a Polaris. Polaris Razor. Check out the full Polaris Razor lineup at Polaris.com or follow them on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Polaris Razor. Anywhere is possible. It's more than just a slogan. Anywhere is possible with General Tire's wide variety of tires for whatever it is that you drive. Whether you're looking for off-road capability balanced with impressive on-road performance or ultra-high performance offering all-season traction designed with a driving enthusiast in mind, General Tire has what you need to get where you're going. General Tire, providing anywhere is possible with a down-and-dirty radio show since 2012. When looking for a new wheel for your off-road vehicle, car, truck, or UTV, the choice is easy. You choose what the pros use. Rob McCachron, Keegan Kincaid, and myself, Jim Beaver, all exclusively use Vision Wheel, whether we're dominating Baja, taking the cup at Cranon, or shredding UTVs. Vision Wheel's trend-setting designs and durability will set you apart from the competition and your friends. Check out visionwheel.com or at Vision Wheel on social media to learn more. Life is all about sound, the sound of sports, the sound of the racetrack, and the sound of your vehicle. Don't drive around listening to this. Drive around listening to the sound of performance. Gibson Performance. Gibson Performance Exhaust is the company who can turn this into this. Remember that life is all about sound, and Gibson Exhaust is the sound of performance. Check out your next catback exhaust system, headers, muffler, or UTV exhaust at GibsonPerformance.com and get more power and more sound. Are you looking for a place to push yourself behind the wheel and see how your driving skills stack up? Dirtfish Rally School is that place. Located on 315 acres of pristine automotive playground at the foot of the Cascade Mountains in Snoqualmie, Washington, right outside of Seattle, Dirtfish Rally School is a one-of-a-kind place where everyone from first-time drivers to seasoned professionals like Bucky Lassick and Antoine Lestage can push themselves to their limit. Whether driving the high-performance rally-prepped all-wheel drive Subaru Impreza STI is what you're looking for, or you'd rather hang it all out in the rear-wheel drive Subaru BR Z's, Dirtfish Rally School has something for everyone. Classes are available from two hours to three full days and feature instructors with over 150 years of combined racing experience. Whether you're looking to become the best and get an edge on the competition or just looking to freshen your skills behind the wheel, Dirtfish Rally School is the place to go. For more information on registering for classes, visit Dirtfish on the web at dirtfish.com or to check out the latest happenings from Dirtfish, follow them on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Dirtfish Rally. You're listening to the Down and Dirty Radio Show, powered by Polaris Razor. All killer and no filler. All right, I'd like to welcome, uh, oh shit, one of my good friends and uh, one of my guests this week, my boy Street Bike <laughs> Tommy, to the show. Tommy, yes, sir. what is going on? You are uh, officially back in the TV business, huh? That's right. I mean, you know, it's not digital, that is. <laughs> Yeah, so back on the airwaves, they actually let you back on TV. Uh, <laughs> uh, man, well, I know this has actually been one you and I have talked confidentially, and I kind of knew something was cranking for a while. But, uh, dude, they gave you a TV show where all you do is blow things up. I mean, like, is there actually a better gig on the planet than that? You know, I, I actually made that joke when I found out, like, what it was. Because, uh, funny story, um <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Tremaine's right hand lady, uh, Shauna, she hit me up and uh she gave me a FaceTime middle of the night and I was like, Hey, what's up? How are things? Like, uh, you know, we sh- we shot shit for a minute and then uh she I was like, So what's up? Because I haven't talked to her in a while and she said, Oh, oh, sorry, uh well, you you think you might want to be on T V again? And I was like, Uh, yeah. <laughs> like no, I don't no want to be on TV. Right? I'm retired, right? Yeah, yeah, right? No yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, no, I'm good. <laughs> so uh, she, I was like, yeah, no problem. She goes, well, what about your uh, barbecue business? I know you're uh, you're doing the barbecue thing. And I was like, yeah, I mean, I'll figure it out no matter what because, like, I'm down for a TV show. Like, let's go. And then, um, you know, she was like, okay, cool. I'll, uh, I'll pass that along, and then we'll have somebody call you tomorrow and – we can do a, you know, a FaceTime interview and then we'll record it and send it in part of the sizzle reel. And I was like, all right, cool. So like, what am I doing? <laughs> and 
And then, uh, yeah, so when she told me, I instantly thought it was a joke because it's from Jeff Tremaine uh, and, and, and uh, Gorilla Flicks. So I was like, uh, yeah, sure. So this is a real thing. I'm going to go around and blow stuff up. Yeah, right. Like literally the only thing that could be cooler if, if I got a job doing a TV show follow me around like oiling up wine tropic models or something you know what i mean yeah like well and it's funny too like with something like this because like it, it could go either way like with you it could be a legitimate hey we're gonna blow stuff up this is a tv show or they could be rebooting like punked and you're getting punked on this deal getting all excited that all of a sudden the run's right. gonna get pulled out from under you so i get it dude like <laughs> you got you got to play it both ways you want to be excited be like am i getting punked like where, where, where's the candid camera here you know dude legitimately like me and tori both like tori belici uh he's the one who actually pitched it to uh jeff and the team and uh me and him both like until probably the third episode we didn't really think it was real we thought it was just like an expensive ploy (laughs) which yeah you never know are they making a tv show with us actually uh you know making a tv show or are we is this all like candid camera like (laughs) yeah they're just like nah yeah right yeah some elaborate scheme which is funny because i never would have thought but i'm like yeah you're a dude that actually has to look over your shoulder and always be watching your back because you've got all these really good friends but you got a whole lot of really good friends that like to play like elaborate pranks man so you got to be watching your back all the time oh yeah (laughs) <laughs> and and here's a little uh, piece of information also that nobody really, I don't think, remembers. But uh, I got a target on my back from a long, 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 long time ago. The very first thing I ever did on TV ever was actually I punked Travis when punked was punked. <laughs> Dude, and I can't even, uh, I didn't, I, I'm th- trying to think. Like, I thought I've seen most of the stuff. I didn't realize that. So you actually punked TP, huh? Oh yeah, dude, you gotta watch it. It's yeah, pretty funny. I'm sure it's on YouTube at this point. I got to, um, man. That's oh yeah. Oh dude, that's rad. I I didn't realize that. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anybody really remembers that. That was God. That must have been 2000. God five. That's something funny. like that. Dude, that, that's like OG, like, I don't want to say, yeah, dude, that's like OG Nitro, like, early days, like, those pictures you post where, like, gosh, like, dude, you were, like, I don't know, like, all clean cut, and, like, Jolene, <laughs> you don't even recognize Jolene, you know, Travis was, like, all-American no, kid, you know, like, holy crap, that was early, that was early days. So crazy, so crazy. Yeah, which is funny, you ever look back, and you're yeah, like, man, man, we've come a long way, this has been a hell of a roller coaster. Yeah, I mean, we, we grew up on TV pretty much. You know what I mean? Like, the first couple of years outside of high school was pretty much uh, all those DVD days, you know? And um, people just, I mean, we've been on TV for such a long time, you know? And, and people forget that people change, man, you know? And they look back at the old stuff. I'm like, yeah, of course I look younger. I was a baby. Yeah. Which is funny, dude, because there's like a double-edged sword there again because, like, I remember my college days, you know, and that. And, like, honestly, I'm glad 99% of that stuff, like, you know, cell phone video was in its infancy and stuff like that, dude. Like, I'm glad that stuff, there's there's no record of that. Like, you guys have a record oh, of it, lying. you know what I mean? Like, part of me goes, oh, we did some fun stuff I wish I would have on video. And then I'm like, yeah, but I'm, I'm pretty glad, like, yeah, 90% nah. of it doesn't exist. Like, you know, I'm like, yeah, like, <laughs> And it's funny because I also think that, too, because, like, even back then, at least it wasn't instant. You know what I mean? Like, you had to have a pretty cool camera. You had to have the batteries charged. Like, it wasn't just your phone, which you carry with you all the time and monitor the battery. Like, it was its own separate thing, and it had a case. And, and like, those it cassette was tapes, those, uh, those small, like, video VCR cassette tapes that went in the, uh, the video camera. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, dude, I'm just, yeah, there there was ways to make video, but it was, yeah, like you said, it wasn't instant like now where it's like, boom, we're live on the internet, everybody can see, you know, and like if somebody. World star, yeah. world star. Yeah. <laughs> oh, dude. Yeah, well, and then along came what, MySpace, right? Did you have a MySpace, Tommy? Dude, I hope to God somebody can pull my MySpace up, man. <laughs> and my MySpace was so cool. Dude. 
Oh man! You know that's archived somewhere. Didn't, like, didn't Justin Timberlake buy MySpace so. at one time? Like you know that whole thing's my, archived at some some place. It, it, it's out there. You know, it's like I wish somebody who buy that bought that company or owns it would just like, hey, we're re-releasing MySpace. Like OG original stuff. You still have your original accounts and make it a thing again. You know? Yeah. Yeah, just like re, re, just open it up. Just open it up and let everybody like take their 15, 20 year old stuff that they haven't seen forever and like that account's active and just like re roll with it, you know? Like, how rad would that be? Dude, I'd be all about that. Dude, we, we need to get together. You, me, TP's got more money than both of us, so we're going to have to have somebody bankroll this. We, <laughs> we, we need to make a, a play for this company and be like, hey, we're going to buy MySpace. Uh, <laughs> And I don't, I don't, I don't think TP got no uh, long loot like that. That's some, that's some J- Justin Timberlake stuff. I don't yeah. know nothing about. Yeah, but you like, I don't know. This stuff's like all, dude. It's out there somewhere. Like, you wonder where that's all at. Somebody, you that or that? What is it? MySpace Tom. I was reading something recently about him. That dude cashed out on that whole thing, and he just travels now, dude. He's got like an Instagram, and he updates yeah. it about once a month with like pictures of him on all these beaches and stuff. And I'm like. Dude, like, I wish that was me. Like, I, I wish I was smart enough at 20 to start something and just cash out and travel the world. Oh, dude, it'd be so rad. I mean, that's the goal, right? That's the, that's the ultimate goal. Yeah. I was always, uh, I'm going to be retired by I'm forty by the time I'm 40. I'm 39 now, dude. That ain't happening. <laughs> you never know. There's, there's always a lottery. Dude, yeah, it's going to be Powerball or something because <laughs> it definitely isn't going to be anything else, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, so yeah, we'll, uh, we'll go back to talk about TV in a minute, but I know you miss, mentioned the barbecue business. I know we had you on, I don't know, you and I talk, we text, but I can't remember the last time we had you actually had on, on air, but, uh, how's the barbecue business going? Cause I know like you were amped, like you started the food truck and then it like steamrolled into all of a sudden there was like a brick and mortar barbecue spot that like closed up and it was like turnkey. You could all of a sudden jump into uh, having your own building. And then like all of a sudden, like you're legit, Tommy, like you're, you're a business owner. Like, wow. You're like living the American yes, dream sir. for sure, dude. <laughs> like how the hell's that been? Yeah. It looks good. On, looks good on paper. And then you, you, you're like, you're the one doing it. And you're like, ah, man, responsibilities. <laughs> I got employees. Like, uh, oh I'm man. Just, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm actually just now leaving, uh, my uh my restaurant now so so how yeah yeah. so uh how is the brick and mortar barbecue business i mean like obviously you got to have some you got to be having some fun with it you know i know there's got to be a stress level you probably didn't even ever fathom you'd have though too yeah i mean it's uh it's been really cool man i love i love doing it every morning i'm the one that wakes up and uh gets to the restaurant uh, you know, by five thirty, and gets all the meat going for the day, and I set the restaurant up, and and then like I'm there until two, actually uh, cutting the meat and serving everyone. So uh, it's pretty cool because people don't expect that, you know. And then I just kind of stand there and shoot the shit with everybody, and uh, the restaurant's looking pretty cool. I got a lot of really rad stuff on the walls. Um, people are really digging the food, which is super nice man i can't tell you how much like that means like just seeing like the response on google yelp and all that stuff and um actually like having people come up and tell me how good it is that's it's it's definitely the fun part man it's uh it's really rewarding um and and you know i am all over the place because i did shoot a tv show within all that (laughs) it's like man uh it's been a 2018 was was a lot well, that's got to be kind of rad, though, for people. Like, I, I didn't even think about that. But, you know, there's a lot of these celebrity restaurants. We're going to call yours a celebrity restaurant. You're a celebrity. Uh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> we're going to call it that. But, like, even, like, something like Pawn Stars, dude. Like, people go in Vegas to the Pawn Stars. Those, those cats are never in that building except for to film. You know what I mean? Like, they people go right. into your restaurant, and you're posting stuff on Instagram and stuff, and they come in. Like, it's, to some people, it's probably got to be a shock. Like, oh, hell, Tommy's actually here. Like, he's serving us. Like, like to me, yeah. that, that's kind of rad because a lot of people in your position, they wouldn't be doing that. And like you said, you got some other projects where you're not there every single day. But, like, nine times out of ten, you're on site. You're there. You're you're cooking the food. Like, to me, like, that goes a long way with people because, like, it's not just your name on the building. Like, you're actually there, you know what I mean, putting in the effort. Like, it's your meat. Like, it's your baby. Yeah. I love it, man. It's it's uh it really is so cool, man. Like we've done a lot of local stuff. Um, 
we were on the local news uh, two weeks ago, and then uh, they talk about us on the radio quite a bit around here, man. It's it's a it's a really really cool thing, man. And, and like to be doing it myself, like all those compliments that I do see online, like that, it means that much more because those are my hands. You know what I mean? Like I I did that. That that was something that I did. You know. Well, in part of you too, it's got to got to be kind of weird because like this whole barbecue thing started out as like a hobby, and now all of a sudden it's become like an occupation. <laughs> I guess that could be said with me and radio and whatever the hell I consider myself nowadays. But like that part of you's got to be like, man, this this is kind of crazy from going and buying your first smoker or whatever to now all of a sudden like, you know, having <laughs> this building and employees well, and like, you know, that's kind of crazy. The fuck. The- yeah, the funny thing is, is like I didn't even uh, have a cooking background. Like I never really, it, that was never really my thing. I like just kind of like always ate at restaurants and stuff. And once I, uh, I actually, it was just crazy happenstance that I got a Traeger uh, from uh, a guy that happened to be dropping one off at Travis's house in California when I was there. And um, you know, uh, Travis needed a hand. So I handled the, the, the Traeger guy and, like, showed him where to set stuff up. And I got talking to him, and uh, he was like, hey, man, you got a social media following? And I was like, uh, yeah. And he sent a Traeger my way, and then I just started cooking stuff that was in that book that it came with that came with the grill. And, man, it turned from that into this restaurant. It's, it's really really crazy how that all worked out yeah are you one of those guys like me where right away you were immediately like oh dude i gotta go on youtube and watch these cats and know how to cook and like were, oh, you, were you do like dude. youtube instructionals like just to- taking them all in the um so the majority of everything that i've learned in my life has started at youtube and then like once i get really like passionate about something by doing youtube videos and, and like finding stuff out myself that's when I start like sourcing out like uh, actual for real professionals that can teach me in person to do the, the, the extended like lesson. You know what I mean? Like I, I'm lucky enough. Uh, I, I did uh, an apprenticeship um, kind of, if you, you had to call it anything, like I, I worked in uh, my buddy's restaurant, Cameron True, uh, who owns Bam Bam's Barbecue in Orem, Utah. He invited me out, and I actually worked in his restaurant for about two months. Uh, That's my only restaurant experience uh, to this day besides my own. And uh, he really showed me, like, how to do production barbecue. And I, like, I lived in his basement for two months working at his restaurant. It was crazy. Dude, that's gnarly. Well, you, it's funny, too, and one thing I've learned about restaurants, and I know nothing about them. I always thought, oh, it'd be cool to have a bar and grill or something like that. I really don't need to do that because I don't need another headache. But, like, <laughs> dude, like, I have I think people on the outside go, oh, that would be fun. But then you start getting in and you start, like, I go to barbecue in my backyard, dude. It's no expense to spare. I'm going to buy the most expensive cut of meat, the most expensive this, that. Like, it, it's like, but, like, when you own a restaurant, you got to start looking at food costs. And then when the market fluctuates, everything it, it affects this. And, you know, dude, like, it, has it taken some of the fun out of it a little bit? Or, or are you still, still like, you know, like, like you know, still all, all about it? Definitely the hardest I've worked in my whole life. Like, I've never worked this hard ever. You there? Did I lose you? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm driving. I'm on the back roads of, uh. Shady Side, Maryland. <laughs> Shady Side, Maryland. Yeah, man, it's where I grew up. So you said it's uh, it's been the hardest you've ever worked, though. Is that, uh, dude? I I gotta ask because I mean the the whole thing was is with nitro and everything else. I don't ever want to go back to doing drywall. Well, at some point, dude, right. it, it, is that like you're looking at that going? That might actually be easier than what I'm doing now. It would be easier, but it's it's not as rewarding. It's not my own, and uh, it's. The main thing that I didn't like about drywall was uh, hanging it wasn't a problem because, like, I'm good at physical. But when – so, actually, even finishing. Like, finishing was never really a big deal. The only thing that really turned me off about drywall was uh, sanding it. Like, sanding drywall is the worst thing that you can do. Like, because you're breathing it. You know what I mean? Whether you got a mask on or not, you're breathing it. And, and, like, you wake up middle of the night coughing and hacking and – it's just it. I felt really, really unhealthy. Yeah. 
So we'll put you on the spot on the drywall conversation. You're doing a room addition to your house. You hiring somebody to do the drywall, or are you doing it yourself? Oh, I'm doing it myself. Okay. All right. All yeah. right. So you'll still do that. You're like, nah, we're going to save a buck. I ain't going to pay somebody else to do it. Yeah, the only reason why I was able to open my restaurant was that I had the skills needed to uh, actually do the physical build-out. Like, I, uh, I refinished all the walls. Uh, repainted everything, put in a new ceiling, uh, recoated the floors, did four coats of poly down on the floors because the, the concrete was trash. Um, you know, was able to get in there and bust the whole thing out myself. Because if, if I had to pay somebody, I wouldn't have been able to do it. Yeah. Do you, do you still have the food truck or did you end up uh, punting that or do you still have the truck? Because that, dude, that was a legit rig you bought. I mean, that was, dude, that was like next level for, for barbecue and all that. Do you still have that or did that end up going down the road? You know, I wish I really could have hung on to it. Um, I, do, I don't have that anymore because um, the entire uh, first seven, eight months that the brick and mortar was open, we didn't move the truck. So, I mean, it's like uh, it was a lot of overhead just to be sitting around doing nothing. Um, and uh, I, I just because I, I, it was on a handshake deal from uh, actually the guy that I apprenticed under Cameron True. And, uh, you know, I felt really bad because it was just so much money just sitting around doing nothing. So uh, I did take it back to him. So um, we're good there. Nice. And uh, the brick and mortar is where it's at. You know, it's like you can you can sell every day and stuff like that. So um, it's definitely awesome. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, I mean, on a daily basis, I, it's kind of weird, dude, because I know at one point, like when I first met you and uh, well, I met Jolene first and you and TP and everybody like, dude, it was like nitro and everything was cranking on all cylinders. Everybody was there in Maryland, you know, um, shoot, Hubert was there keeping everything running. Wessel was building ramps. Like everybody was kind of close, like, you know, in the, in the area and stuff like that. Now I feel like, you know, you know, everything's, everybody's kind of Jolene's in SoCal now. And like, you're there. Wessel's like become a nomad. We don't even know where the hell he's at at any given time. (laughs) Um, (laughs) <laughs> like, yeah, dude, but I, I haven't even talked to Hubert in probably like four or five months, and I used to get almost daily texts from him. Like, you feel like I mean, everybody's still kind of around the compound once in a while, or like you guys ever get together? Like, I I feel like everybody's kind of scattered a little bit, you know, the past couple of years. Well, the original cast of Nitro, uh, me, Jolene, uh, Jim, uh, special, like we're all. You know, no, no, nobody's doing anything with Nitro um, currently. Uh, we all kind of have our own projects going on, um, mostly because it's, like, all touring now. Yeah. Um, there's no, like, TV or, or movies that we're doing. Um, but it's a world tour, and, and the, these kids nowadays are sending it so big. And, and, like, you know, budgeting, they don't really have our numbers and stuff like that. Um, so, I mean... It's, uh, it's one of those things where cost-wise it just makes more sense for them uh, to do it with, like, you know, the younger athletes that are out there trying to make a name for themselves and stuff like that. And, man, they, they, they put on a great show. Um, but everybody, you know, Jolene, she's a stunt woman uh, in California. It. You know, she's in, you know, big-time movies now. And, um, you know, Jim's here. He does a lot of demolition work, uh, you know, commercial construction and stuff like that that – He's doing good, and uh, Special Greg's hanging tires for NASCAR down in uh, North Carolina. So, I mean, um, it's kind of funny. And Andy, Andy Bell actually has his own uh, production company, and he makes big-time commercials for, like, Toyota and stuff. Yeah, dude, he's killing um, it. So, I mean, yeah. That was didn't, – didn't they do something uh, – correct me if I'm wrong. I know, like, so when we put you in that rally car with Rally America – then, like, a couple of events later, didn't he, didn't Bell get you to do, like, some TV for, like, Toyota at the event or something like that? Yeah, so uh, he had me doing uh, some hosting gig uh, for Toyota for the last stop of that uh, that year's um, uh, season. And uh, I just, ha- you know, that's just happenstance that I was there. Uh, but I ended up placing third in the in the in the season for uh, for for uh, having my points from the one race. 
So I was, I was pretty pumped. Yeah, well, it was one race that you won. It was funny. <laughs> I kind of forgot about that whole thing. And then uh, actually it was kind of sometime in December, somebody tagged me on Twitter on the video because Nitro came out and then uh, I was used in the video a little bit and uh, somebody tagged me in it. I went back and watched that and I kind of had forgotten about that whole thing. You know what I mean? And that whole, that whole project. And then I was like, Oh, I, you know, I forgot like Tommy's legit rally winner there. <laughs> That's right. That's right. We uh, came home with the uh, B spec victory. <laughs> yeah. You're undefeated dude. Undefeated in rally competition. I'm- you know, no big deal. <laughs> Batting a thousand. You better record than TP, dude. You're, you're perfect. <laughs> oh, dude. I'm against Travis in actual for real uh, sanctioned competition, I'm undefeated. I even beat him uh, in uh, Big Buck Hunter World Championships. <laughs> Uh, I forgot about that too. You know what's sad? Like, it, it does stuff like that still to this day is a little bit under TP skin. Like, like at some point he's gonna put you in a rally car just so he can beat you. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I show up when it's time. You know, I just uh, I don't put my game face on until I have to. Dude, I felt so bad for him because all that went down. And, uh, you know, everything's going on. And then uh, homie's motorhome broke down on the way back to Pennsylvania or to, uh, <laughs> excuse me, to, uh, to Maryland, dude. I felt so bad. I was like, you want to kick a boy when he's down? TP had it that weekend so bad. Oh, dude. Because we rode up together. <laughs> and uh, my, my lady at the time uh, drove my car up. And we were, you know, driving home separate. But, um he didn't even stick around to see how I was going to do in the rally. Once he crashed, he packed everything up and he rolled out. But then when he broke down, the funny part was I even beat him home. <laughs> oh. He was so upset, man. Uh, but he's a good sport, man. Trav, he's he's uh, he's definitely a heart of gold, like one of the best dudes in the entire world because, like, you know, as bad as you could be at something like that and, like, be like, oh, well, you know, you did never beat me. You're not better than me. Like he knows, he knows that I would never beat him in a rally. Like, um, he, he still like, he lets me jab at him every once in a while. I'm bringing it up, but, um, he, he's been just a super good sport about all that. You know, um, I know it gets under his skin just because like he got other people coming to him and saying, Hey, remember that time Tommy beat you at a rally? <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, we all know it's a good fun and, and, uh, he knows he knows exactly who he is, so it's it's pretty cool having a buddy like him, man. Yeah, no, dude, you want to talk about a heart of gold, I, dude? I I've I, I've known TP for years, and then when we got to spend like almost a week together doing that whole star car thing in the middle of nowhere, in Nevada, like we really got to know each other. And you want to talk about just a genuine salt of the earth dude? You know what I mean? Like he's he's exactly that, right? right? But dude, that boy likes to have some exactly, fun. Yeah. And then one thing I learned. Dude, there is, and you guys had told me there's always bets going on. I did not realize yeah. with TP, dude, there literally like everything is bet on everything. You better have a roll of hundreds it, in your it, wallet it doesn't, or something because, dude, there's always yeah. a bet on something. You know, it never turns off ever. No, it's like, what color is the car going to come around the corner next? You know, or something like it could be the stupidest thing. You know, there's money <laughs> on it. It's like so dumb. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, he, he's definitely a uh, um, cut from a, a single piece of cloth, and they they did not make two. Dude, a true true story there. So uh, take us back to uh, this TV show, man. I know. Uh, so episode one is dropped. How many episodes we got in the season? Uh, what can we expect out of this? Where can people tune in, man? Because uh, uh, I I don't know. Tommy blowing stuff up. Uh, it seems to go hand in hand pretty good. I think the the ratings <laughs> got to be pretty solid for this. Dude, so far, uh, we, we had the first episode premiere uh, last Wednesday, 10 p.m. Eastern, and uh, it's on the Science Channel. Um, and it's funny, man, like, I wasn't expecting it to really be anything. Like, I was just kind of like, oh, yeah, I get to do this. Uh, Science Channel greenlit us for six uh, one-hour episodes is what we filmed. Um, and we the first one just came out last week. And the numbers are good, man. Like, we, we actually are the second highest rated premiere that science has ever had. Really? Uh, and that's counting 
even when cable was much, much bigger. So uh, it's actually really impressive in today's climate with the TV uh, the way it is, yeah. you know, because most people are streaming um, to have those numbers. So uh, it was very, very impressive. And uh, it's looking good, man. We got another episode coming up tonight at 10 p.m. Um, uh, Science Channel. And if you don't have Science Channel, uh, Science actually has an app. It's called uh, Science Go. And uh, you don't need a TV provider or anything like that. Uh, you can watch the episodes that are currently coming out um, for free on the app. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. So what's what's the premise of the show? Obviously, we know you're blowing stuff up, you know what I mean? But uh, like, obviously, it's on Science Channel, too. So there's going to be a little bit of a backstory to, like, kind of the science of things. But, like, kind of take us through uh, the first episode, you know, and, like, what, you know, what, what actually, what can people expect when they're tuning in? Because obviously, Tommy and explosions go hand in hand. But what are they actually going to get on the TV show? <laughs> So there's a there's actually a, so much science involved, and actually like I actually watched uh, the episode last week for the first time like when it came out, um, so I actually didn't even know what to expect. So uh, when I actually saw so much uh, information and like they had diagrams and like there was actually a lot of science for real for real science on the show to go along with like explaining explosions and blast pressure and, um, you know, all kinds of stuff. I was very, very surprised at the amount of science that was actually in it. But um, it's the, the show premise is essentially kind of, if I had to describe it in any way, it's kind of like uh, dirty jobs. Okay. But instead of the jobs being dirty, they're explosive. So we're showcasing jobs in the explosives industry and kind of like explaining the science of explosions throughout. Yeah. So your next job is going to be an explosive expert. Uh, we've gone gone from stunt guy to uh, to, <laughs> to barbecue guy. Now we're we're going to be, uh, dude. Your resume is going to be pretty deep after this. Explosions, barbecue, stunts. Yeah. Like. <laughs> I'm looking. I'm looking to be a published scientist. You know. So. <laughs> oh, dude, that's. <laughs> Next thing you know, they're going to be on the next like uh, Mar or the uh, lunar mission where they're going to land astronauts on the moon here in a few years or something. You know, well, me the- dude, that that actually wouldn't be too far outside of my scope because uh, I did go to space camp when I was a kid. So. Did you really? I uh, dude, that was one of those. I always yeah. wanted to go to space camp. So did you get to do the floating around? Because don't they have like an anti gravity room or something? Or was that like a wind tunnel? I don't know. I just remember the. TV commercials on it on um, on Nickelodeon, dude. It was like I think that was like the on Double Dare. That was like the ultimate prize, sending you to space camp or something. Dude, I actually did go down to Alabama. I went to the actual space camp, uh, and I did do the zero G experience. But it's not a room. Uh, they put you in a plane, and the plane flies faster to the Earth than gravity. So that's where you get your zero G because as soon as they go into a dive, uh, you are experiencing zero G until they pull back up. Wow. Or until you hit the ground. (laughs) Dude, that's gnarly. Dude, as a kid, that's got to be kind of intense though. Like being in a plane that all of a sudden's like heading towards the ground. Like (laughs) (laughs) it was super cool, man. Like it was still like, of my childhood, that was one of my greatest uh, childhood experiences that I can remember, man. And uh, we didn't come from a lot of means, man. So uh, shout out to my pops uh, for holding it down for us because we, we had, like, no money. And he was able to send uh, me, my brother, and my sister to space camp when we were kids. And uh, we didn't do a lot. Like, my whole childhood, we didn't do a lot, but we did do that. But. Dude, that's saying something, though, to have that experience as a kid. And after everything you've done now, like in your career, and you, you've done just about anything anybody's ever wanted to do, you know what I mean? Like, to go back and be yeah. like, dude, that was one of my best memories from being a kid is space camp. Like, dude, that's saying a, a lot, dude. That That's like, that's kind of rad, you know, that to have well, that experience and be able to go back to him and be like, yeah, that that was awesome. Because, like, that's the one thing that I, I hope I get to pass along in my lifetime it's just that, that people need to realize that it's not doing something. It, it's when you do it and what it means to you at that point in your life. Like, 
I still remember those those memories extremely fondly because of at what point in my life that happened to me. Yeah. You know, like uh, if I was to, you send me a space camp right now, I'm I'm gonna be like, this is so dumb. Like, why why am I here? You know what I mean? Um, but capturing that that you know that childhood excitement and and like wonder, you know, and and man, it, it just sparks so much creativity in you as a, as a, as a kid. And, uh, you know, it really opens your, your mind up because like I traveled, like that was the first time I traveled by myself ever without my parents. They put me on a plane and sent me on my way. Um, and, uh, I spent two and a half, I think it was like two and a half weeks, something like that. Wow. In, uh, Alabama at space camp and, um, no parents and just being there bunking up and like, you know, being, put in a new situation with new kids, new friends. And, uh, it, it was, it was, uh, definitely one of the best experiences of my life because of when it happened to me, you know? Yeah. And I, that's funny. Cause I think there's something to be said of like, I remember when I was a kid, I went to, uh, I went to basketball camp in Tucson at, uh, at the university of Arizona. And like every, uh, I went for like three or four years and it's one of those, like, you're going away from home. There might be one other kid you know from your town, but by and large, there's kids from all over the state or the country there. And like, you're thrown into these dorms with somebody you don't even know, and like, you know, you're you're yeah. like on your own. And as a kid, dude, that's kind of crazy to be like, oh, I'm living on my own for a week, you know. And like, one, you have a lot of fun, but two, like, it's a dude, you learn a lot about people, about yourself. Like, it's it's kind of completely different, you know. I honestly, they, 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 like if if you have the ability to send your kids off to do something like that, I firmly believe you should because it just makes you a better person, you know. Um, it teaches you how to be respectful to people and you know fit in in new situations like that, and it you know it lets you know that uh, you know the world isn't just your backyard. You know, the world's a big place and it's small at the same time. You know, um, I, I I really think all kids should be you know, if, if they're, if they have the ability to get out and experience stuff like that, I think they should. Yeah, no, completely agreed, man. So, uh, gotta, gotta say like, we're, we're talking about all this TV and everything else, but, uh, one thing I got, I guess I got to tip my cap to you just a little bit, but, uh, your Ravens, they, they kind of got a good team this year, Tommy. <laughs> yeah, let's go Lamar. That's right. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, dude. Lamar has been on fire and, uh, my good friend uh, Matt Judon, he has just been incredible defense, man. He's been sacking quarterbacks, making plays, man. Like the whole team in general uh, has been insane, man. And uh, what about old Pat Ricard, man? Big old 300 pound tight end. Him and uh, Nick, Clark, like they're um, they're out there killing it, man. Like uh, the. the 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 tight end game is strong on, on the Ravens. Yeah. Well, I know you got a lot of buddies on the team. One of your buddies got shipped off here to Arizona, but uh, how many games a year? My I man, mean, Matt. Yeah, dude. How many games a year you, you go to quite a few Ravens games? I mean, yeah. I know I, I see you pop up on Instagram once in a while when you're at the games and, and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I really need to catch up with old Max Williams. Max Williams is a really good friend of mine down in Arizona, man. I, I'm telling you, like, I'm going to try to do a, a double duty trip. We got to come out and hit the desert, uh, me and you, and then we'll go catch a, a Cardinals game, man, because uh, Max got extended till that, you know, through next year. Yeah, no, dude, that's done. We got to make that deal happen. That'll be fun. Well, we dra- well, I don't know. What, yeah, I was going to say we'll drag him out and put him in some razors too, but I don't know what the, I, I'm pretty sure that's a no-no <laughs> in the middle of the NFL season. They're like, no, nah, pump the brakes, stop. What are you thinking? You know? Yeah, we probably just want to probably just want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> do it and you know ask ask forgiveness later you don't ask permission ask forgiveness later that's one of those deals right <laughs> that's been my whole career my whole career <laughs> so that being said i don't know if we've ever talked about you visiting the white house my man uh was that one of those ones? <laughs> i gotta ask there, there's got to be a lot uh, there's got to be a lot of things you're in the white house you're like man i would love to be able to check what's behind that door i'd like to open this drawer oh. like, dude there, there had to been a lot of like uh, urges that you didn't scratch while you were there like but there had to been a lot of urges just like uh. curiosity you know what i mean well, so just a heads up, if you ever get a chance to go on a tour through the White House, uh, when you're in the main foyer, don't 
play the piano. <laughs> Note to self, <laughs> don't play the piano in the White House. I, I almost got taken out, man. My, like, I, 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 like, walked over to the piano, and I was like, da-da-da-da-da, and I, like, hit, like, two keys, and, like, this dude, like, straight up had a step on me, and I was like, ah, okay, I'm not touching the piano anymore, because, like, I saw his body language, and uh, he, he, like, had that fast twitch, like, he, he, he took a step, you know what I mean? <laughs> I was like, uh-oh, uh, don't touch that. <laughs> well, and it's funny because I'm like, you know, they send TP and they send you, and, uh, you know, you guys are guys that like to push limits just in general, right? And here you guys are in the White House, and I, I got to feel bad for, for Lindsay because at some point she's probably looking around like, what the hell did I show up here with these two guys for? <laughs> yeah, man, uh, it, it was a good time for sure. Um <laughs> Big shout out to uh, my, my Secret Service buddies that I met through Tim Montana. Oh, nice. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, I, um, I actually, uh, that's how we actually got to um, to be able to be at the White House uh, was because uh, through Tim Montana, country music singer. Nice. Um, Tim yeah. is, is uh, good friends of uh, a lot of veterans. And uh, he's he's good friends with a couple of Secret Service guys, and uh, they were nice enough to to give us the open invite uh, through Tim. Yeah, it was a uh, that was something that I've always wanted to do because we grew up so so close to Washington D.C. So um, yeah, that was definitely on the bucket list as far as something that I wanted to see if I was able ever um, was the White House, and that was like tippy top of one of the coolest experiences that I've been able to do is like go hang out in the white house. Yeah. Well, which is funny too, because you know, oh, you, you, you got people that are like, you know, they live in SoCal and people all the time, like, Oh yeah, you go to Disneyland all the time. They're like, nah. And you guys are so close to Washington DC and people would assume like you've been to Smithsonian, you've seen all the monuments, but it's something that gets close. So like you, you just, it's something you don't really, you probably don't go to DC hardly ever. Right. Well, that's, that's the majority. Like that's uh, like everybody that you'll talk to here. That's, that's pretty much how it is. Like nobody really goes that's uh, from here, but me personally, I'm, I'm a history guy. So like, I really dig in like super hard on all that stuff. So like I've been to the Smithsonian uh, quite a bit and I've been to the aerospace museum and uh, I go, I've been all the monuments and uh, I actually grew up doing a lot of commercial construction in Washington DC and around those buildings. So it's uh that's a it's always had a, a spot near and dear to my heart. Um I I've been quite a bit and uh you know they they got some pretty nice clubs uh ah. in DC where you can really cut loose and put your shine on. Oh dude, the clubs in DC that was like a, yeah, I got to yeah, it's straight up putting you on the spot. I know there was a there was a point where you were a big club guy. You still ever hit them up once in a while? You, there's a, <laughs> as that ship sailed, like you're you're better off just the local like well, local watering hole having a drink or something. I I've definitely turned into more of a pub guy because I can't really afford that club life no more. <laughs> um but yeah man, I, I do uh I do like to shine it up every once in a while and uh go big, but I haven't done that in quite some time. Oh, that mean that means you're due, <laughs> right? If you haven't done it in quite some time. <laughs> um <laughs> maybe when you're in town maybe when you're in town well, we'll make we'll it happen we'll go, we'll go clubbing when i'm in town dude that'll be train wreck with you and i at a club it, it, uh, <laughs> it might be a train wreck worth watching though so <laughs> uh, oh dude count me in man oh, count dude. me in we'll, we'll have to we'll have to make it happen for sure man but uh dude tommy always fun catching up buddy uh congrats on the new show on uh on science channel man uh, I know I got uh, I got it locked into the DVR and uh, I'm gonna have to go catch up on uh, on you know on the first episode and uh, I guess get on point for tonight's. But uh, man, always uh, always fun yeah. having you on, brother. My man, I really appreciate you always having me on, man. I've, it's been a really awesome friendship for a long time here, Jim, and I appreciate you. Yeah, for sure, dude. Same thing, yeah. and uh, we will definitely get out to Maryland this spring for sure, buddy. Sounds good, brother. I'm 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 waiting. I'm waiting. You just let me know. 
I'm Polaris rider Jim Beaver. I race trophy trucks professionally, host a down and dirty radio show, and also travel the country announcing motorsports events. I've seen it all, and trust me, I've done most of it, so when it comes time to relax on the weekend, nothing is better than taking time with my family in our Razor vehicles. They've got the reliability I need to just pick up and go explore the desert dunes or trail and have the capability to attack even the harshest terrain. If you're looking for some of the most reliable and safest and hands down most capable off-road machines in the world, look no further than Polaris and their award-winning lineup of Razor vehicles. Whether you want your daughter to experience off-road driving for the first time in a Razor 170 like me, take the entire family out in a Razor XP4 1000 on the weekend, or shred the desert and dunes in the all-new Razor XP 1000 Fox Edition, Polaris has you handled. Take my advice and join me and some of the best drivers in the world by driving a Polaris. Polaris Razor. Check out the full Polaris Razor lineup at Polaris.com or follow them on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Polaris Razor. Life is all about sound. The sound of sports. The sound of the racetrack. And the sound of your vehicle. Don't drive around listening to this. Drive around listening to the sound of performance. Gibson Performance. Gibson Performance Exhaust is the company who can turn this into this. Remember that life is all about sound, and Gibson Exhaust is the sound of performance. Check out your next catback exhaust system, headers, muffler, or UTV exhaust at GibsonPerformance.com and get more power and more sound. Whether you're looking for a tire that balances high-performance responsiveness and traction in wet and light snow conditions, excellent handling and traction in wet and dry conditions, or a summer performance tire designed with a driving enthusiast in mind, General Tire has you covered. From the all-new G-Max RS to the Grabber ATX, no matter what you drive, General Tire will get you where you're going. Learn more at GeneralTire.com. General Tire, cruising with a down-and-dirty radio show since 2012. Do you race or are you a weekend warrior? Have you checked on the date on your helmet recently? Don't get caught off guard by using an outdated helmet. Impact Racing, the leader in motorsport safety, has new SA 2015 helmets to fit your budget. Whether you're looking for a helmet with a full carbon fiber shell to take you to victory at the Indy 500 or just looking for some helmets for a weekend at Glamis, Impact Racing has a helmet for you. Find out more information at impactraceproducts.com or on Facebook at Impact Safety. Super ATV is the industry leader in aftermarket UTV and ATV parts and accessories. Super ATV products are designed, engineered, tested, and manufactured right here by Super ATV. Whether you're looking to upgrade your suspension, get stronger axles, or you're looking for a new winch to get you out of a tough spot, Super ATV has what you're looking for. And since we know you're in a hurry, we offer fast, free shipping to the lower 48 states on all orders. Visit SuperATV.com now and get your UTV or ATV dialed in. Like what you hear? Catch all the back episodes of the Down and Dirty Radio Show on Apple Podcast, and be sure to rate, review, and subscribe. Welcome back here to the Down and Dirty Radio Show, powered by Polaris Razor. I guess I got to get accustomed to it. The General Tire Down and Dirty Show, powered by Polaris Razor. Yes, GT. Thank you guys for the support. Thanks to Polaris Razor for the support as well. Vision Wheel, Dirtfish, Gibson, Exhaust, Rigid Industries. Yes, they are stepping in in a big way this year. GSP XTV Axles, RacingJunk.com, iRacing, all of our amazing partners. I mean, Pro Armor in the racing program. We got all kinds of crazy partners. Impact Race Products, 4WP, Optimus. Yes, our good friends at Optimus back on board this year as well. HCR, we just have so many amazing partners. Thank you guys for the support. Thanks to all of you guys for tuning in. Much appreciated for everybody. Go and smash that subscribe button on iTunes. Help us out. It does help us out when you subscribe on itunes not gonna lie and if you leave a rating it really helps us a ton please do that follow me at at jim beaver 15 on social media and uh, you know what guys i gotta sign off i am going racing this weekend we will be back to normal we're gonna have new intros we're gonna have new segments new partners new people it is gonna be an awesome awesome 2020 and it all starts next week right here on the show thank you guys for the continued support we're eight years in i mean not many shows make it this long and things are getting bigger and better than ever thank you guys i can't say that enough and uh you know what i'm signing off though because i gotta strap on my dirt fish helmet and i gotta go and try and win a race tomorrow so thank you guys and we'll see you back here next week right here on the show